All right. Good morning, guys. Go ahead and get started. Um, I've graded the homeworks, and I will pass those back. I started on the critical review assignments as well. Didn't quite get those finished yet, so we'll give those back probably on Thursday. So today we're going to talk about disinfection, which is a favorite of mine. I like to start off by asking, asking you guys what the difference between sterilizing and disinfecting something is. So if I take this water and I irradiate it with a bunch of UV light, is that, you know, Maybe, let's say to the point where you know we meet common disinfection standards is that also sterile probably not, probably not. yes no maybe yeah okay the other the other two have answered you you have to now <laughs> so no, no not sterile okay so the definition the definitions here are pretty important because I actually do have a UV light and we will use it today because that's fun. Um, the, the deal is how we define sterile is basically whether or not something can reproduce. Okay, so it's not even whether it's living or dead. Let me come to the slides. We, we define it as like if, if we sterilize an animal, for example, we're making it so that it can no longer reproduce or we would call some hybridized species um, as sterile. Um, you know, a, a mule is a sterile animal. So there's, there's a few ways to think about it, but essentially when we're talking about pathogens, we don't want them to be able to multiply. You know, a, as much toxins as one botulinum bacteria can produce, uh, we're not really concerned about one of them because that's going to be like nanograms or less of whatever toxin, right? We, what we're concerned about in terms of pathogens is them reproducing and then making a toxin or reproducing and causing an infection. And that infection is literally them multiplying. So when we say sterile, we actually don't even need them to be dead. We just need them to not be reproducing. At the same time, when we talk about disinfection, we, 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 Again, we want them to be inactivated or um, unable to reproduce, but we only care about it down to the point where they're no longer at infectious levels, right? So we could just completely destroy every single living thing in here, and that would be sterile, or denature the DNA and everything in here, but all the cells can still be living and just can't reproduce. We could also call that sterile, or we could say, Let's just remove most of the bacteria. And if there, was, if there were pathogenic bacteria, there's only a few left. Okay, that's disinfected, but that's not what we consider sterile. So there's kind of a, um, two, two things at play there um, that we can consider. It's kind of, kind of a nuanced, just uh, nomenclature there, but it is kind of interesting. I, I have no doubt there are many thousands of bacteria and viruses in this water, and yet I'm going to be happy to drink it, right? And the viruses are probably mostly like algae viruses or who knows what, something that infects other bacteria. The bacteria themselves are probably whatever was in my mouth last time I drank from the bottle, you know, it's just kind of whatever. Not too many things coming from the drinking plant, presumably, just fill it up in our nice little... Uh, water bottle fillers here. So hopefully there's not, not too much stuff in there. 
because it has been disinfected. So even though I might be drinking lots and lots of bacteria, should be okay. So that's, that's kind of our distinction there. So as we think about our drinking water treatment process, wanted to come back to kind of the, the very basics here and take a look at where our disinfection processes fall within the system. And that would be after we've done basically everything we were planning to do to remove particles, remove other contaminants. And essentially when we have the cleanest water, then we're gonna disinfect. Often I'm gonna use a plug flow type contactor that gives us the best um, kinetic setup. We might add, add fluoride or do something, um, whatever other polishing steps, perhaps dechlorinate a little bit, convert the re remaining chlorine into what we call residual chlorine. We might do that kind of just after the disinfection. And then we send it to the distribution, which in some sense, we also consider that as part of the treatment because we do need enough residual disinfectant uh, to keep the pipes clean and prevent growth of, um, growth of pathogens. So when we think about pathogens, we want to consider what different types we are dealing with so that we can know something about how we deal with them. And so I want to cover some basics today, viruses, bacteria, and protozoa. And it becomes a, a little bit of a, a funny and interesting discussion as we think about how we know this information. So if we think about different viruses that could be in the water that we really don't want to be drinking in terms of food and waterborne illness, some things come to mind, norovirus, rotavirus, poliovirus, obviously some bad ones. If you've ever had like a bout of food poisoning where you ate something kind of not so good earlier in the day and then suddenly you have a really bad night, um, chances are good that was probably a, something like a norovirus or a rotavirus. Um, those, those ones only take about eight hours to incubate and then you have a bad day or a bad night. Um, something like an E. coli infection, salmonella, that can be anywhere from 12, 24 hours to you know, two days before you become symptomatic. Um, it would also be a very bad time um, and you'd regret life there for, for a couple days. You also have protozoa. Um, Cryptosporidium and Giardia are two common ones. If you've ever heard of like hiker's diarrhea or something, if you go hiking, don't treat your water properly, um, you get, get one of these and then you probably have diarrhea for a couple months and it feels like it never goes away. Um, there are also amoebic cysts. Now, a, a few things about these. If we consider viruses, for example, how many viruses does it take to actually make you sick? You know, we, we were talking about that this difference between disinfection and sterilization. Well, how many do we need to get it down to before we can consider it disinfected? So as we design our different treatment options, that's kind of our metric. Okay, what is the safe level? And can we build in a safety factor, make sure we're well below the safe level, right? And then, you know, if we're doing UV disinfection, we're going to design it such that we, you know, based on what might be in the environment, maybe on a, a uh, if we were taking surface water, let's say, and we've got bacteria in, the, in our lake or river, of course, maybe we want to check the, the worst case scenario when it's in the middle of the summer, lots of biological activity, and it rains. And so all the, all the stuff is flushed in, there's lots of particles, there's just lots of junk in the water. What's the standard there? And let's make sure we, we're treating that to the point where we don't have too many bacteria. So we can call it disinfected, it's not infectious. Well, for viruses, a lot of them, it tends to be in the thousands, The, well, really the hundreds to thousands range. Some of them, some of them can actually be um, even lower, but typical would be hundreds to thousands um, range of that many viruses in order to guarantee 
you, you've got an infection if you were to ingest it. Bacteria, and, and this, this does vary from virus to virus. Um, I think norovirus might even be in the, like around 50 or something like that. Um, bacteria can vary a lot based on their physiology. Vibri Vibrio cholera, for example, um, which we're going to talk about a little more in a couple of minutes. This one takes something like 10 to the 6, so millions of cells. And the reason for cholera to take so many is because our stomach acid actually does a pretty good job destroying it. Uh, so cholera um, is particularly vulnerable to acidic conditions. And so if I happen to know that my water was contaminated with cholera, I really would would prefer to drink it on an empty stomach so that I have more stomach acid. And I can guarantee that my stomach is at a higher acidity. And I would also want to drink it uh, sip by sip. So, you know, not just flush a whole bunch down, right? So if I, if I had to drink a, a glass full of cholera infested water, that, that would be my plan. Wait, you know, multiple hours, maybe six, eight hours after dinner, you know, after a meal just to be safe and then just sip it down. <laughs> <laughs> so you can potentially actually, um, you know, help help your defense that way if if you had to drink some uh, some water. I wouldn't recommend drinking dirty water, regardless. But um, and likewise, cholera can be uh, one of the things you you can get from uh, eating raw oysters. So in Louisiana, that's a thing to do. Um, you can get stuff like norovirus, rotavirus, if they happen to be filtering water that some living organism that had a, a, a warm gut has excreted into. Oysters do a good job filtering the water and virus particles tend to stick on that kind of stuff. So if you happen to have that situation, maybe consider eating raw oysters on an empty stomach just to, to give yourself a little better chance if you're going to eat them. You could also always just charbroil them and solve that problem before it's a problem. Um, things like E. coli, I think, are kind of in the 10,000s. E. coli and Salmonella, pretty similar. And those guys, uh, some of the species will actually produce a toxin. So it, for some cases, it's just that they're growing and infecting, and they're in kind of the wrong part of your stomach, and they shouldn't be there, so your body's reacting to them. And other cases, the the uh, worst strains and the ones that um, have potential to cause more harm and possibly deaths and vulnerable people and such, um, they actually produce a toxin. And that toxin is then what re um, is giving a big problem. So a lot of, let's say, the viruses are going to give you what you would call food infection, where a toxin itself, if a toxin is produced, then you have food poisoning. We, we call kind of everything food poisoning, but typically this is um, a food infection. The uh, cryptosporidium is a very low dose. This is something like three to five cells or cysts. And so when we think about how many, how many cysts or whatever is going to be in water, there's an, another interesting factor here is how many are excreted from some sick individual or some sick animal. So understanding how many are going to be in the environment, how many are likely to be in the water, because if, if we have in maybe some natural water source um, a thousand crypto cells per liter, and then we want to treat, treat that to a drinkable level where you're not having, you're having less than three to five cells in a, a day of drinking water or something, then you can kind of start designing your treatment criteria. It's okay if every once in a while you have one of these cells, probably. Um, likewise for the other categories. Now, any of you know how we know these numbers? Ian probably does if you remember. Yeah. Any ideas how, how we figured this out? Yes. So the, it, it's quite funny to think about, actually. Um, the CDC will 
occasionally have these studies where they, they want to know some information about how an infectious, what's the infectious dose for some pathogen. And so apparently they will uh, pay pretty well. They'll uh, pay volunteers like, hey, you want a thousand bucks? Um, come, I'll, we'll give you a thousand bucks. You get, we can put you up in a hotel-like place and you'll, we'll provide all your food because they want to control the food you, you eat so that, to make sure there's no additional um, pathogens that you're exposed to. So, so they want to have a good control of your environment. You know, we'll give you Wi-Fi, whatever. Um, you just might get sick because we're going to give you this pill and it, maybe, maybe it's placebo, so it's just a, a sugar pill. Maybe, maybe you get the low dose and you only had 10 viruses and it's going to take more than that. Maybe it is, it, it is like gambling, right? Um, you know, and they're obviously going to provide health care if there's any, you know, issues. And they're, they probably wouldn't offer it to somebody who's vulner, vulnerable to the point where they would be likely to have serious problems. So, but, you know, like a college student, grad student, it's like, oh, man, I, I wish I had heard of that opportunity. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> I pro you know, if you're the, the unlucky one that doesn't get the placebo, gets a high dose and you're symptomatic because, you know, you could also be lucky and just be asymptomatic, right? That's another pe piece of data. Sitting on toilet with a fever is not like my kind of thing. Right, <laughs> right. Is it, you know, how, how are you going to earn, earn your bucks? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's kind of funny to think about that. Um, and it, the, that concept ends up tying back to the the old adage, and I forgot who said it, but the dose makes the poison, right? And in the same sense, we can consider in infections that way as well. And the, the dose the dose of pathogens that we consume, food or water, um, that's going to determine whether or not we get sick. I, I still fast in Seoul for about like 50 years. <laughs> oh, oh, when they were like still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Yep. Cuz I know that they had one that was that high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, like for the crypto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that person is definitely having a bad yeah, time. <laughs> yeah. So I that's a Yeah, and actually the crypto that that would you'd need um kind of a longer time frame for that one. So that's cuz that that's illness lasts a longer time. So that's that's interesting, you know, and you can't you normally can't test directly on human subjects, so you have to have volunteers set up this way. So there's there's actually like ethical review panels for this type of thing, and you have to get all these approvals. Like, no, you you have to be sure that you're not just like coercing people because the money is so good, but you also don't want to not pay them when they're getting sick. You know, <laughs> so a weird, I think like a weird you just have to tell them like exactly what would happen, like the worst case scenario. You have to like tell them, right? And I mean, it'd be like one of those commercials when, when, they, when they give you the um, shoot. Oh, oh yeah, all the all the um all side, side effects, effects. <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's like they cause death. Don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> yep. Okay, so with that, I want to talk just a little bit about epidemiology. Um, really, the study and where we began with the study of how diseases are tracked. And I want to talk about this because when we think about waterborne disease and disinfection, really a lot of the roots are when we first begin to identify water as a potential source of um, infection. So epidemiology in kind of a broader context is tracking or creating maps of disease incidents and John Snow, who may or may not be related to myself and may or may not know anything. Um, I actually have a brother named John, um, Jonathan. So it's J-O-N even, uh, which is the Game of Thrones version. Um, it, it's funny. When he was in, he's my younger brother. And when he was in high school, the show was not out, but the books were out. And so there was one group of uh, nerdy kids who had read the books. And he would always, he would always pick on my brother, apparently, saying, you know nothing. He's, so he he knew something about Game of Thrones before uh, before all, it all came out. So anyway, this this John Snow um, did not have any children, so not directly related, but who knows? Um, he was what what we refer to him as the father of epidemiology because in the 1850s there was a bad cholera outbreak in London, and uh, if you've ever 
if you've ever been, you can visit the Broad Street Pump, where which was essentially the epicenter. Um, and uh, you know, we'll talk about that, about why it's famous, but it's kind of a historic landmark. And it was really one of the first times we've, uh, in uh, known history, that we actually tracked the causal relationship. Here's the cause of the disease and the source of it, and why these people got sick. Um, it's really kind of in that era of the development of the germ theory of disease, and really uh, kind of a big step forward in um, motivating water treatment in general. Okay, so the, the uh, he made what what we now call the ghost map, which essentially was a map. Um, it, it also made it into a um, what do you call it? It's like a fictionalized historic historic fiction. But it is it's like what they've done was they took these the real story with the uh, as much real accounts from newspaper and stuff, all of that. And then they've um, added the, a fictional element where they filled in details of like what the people were actually saying and doing in the moment to fit into the, the actual historical account so that it's readable like a novel in a sense. So it's a, it's a great read, it's a simple read. Um, that's by Stephen Johnson and it, it follows um, the, the Jon Snow um, ghost map of uh, this cholera outbreak. So back then, you know, it was just the plague. They didn't know what was causing the plague. They attributed it to stuff like miasma, which is a word that just they used to describe just the general stink and nastiness of the air, the atmosphere in um, areas. You know, this was before sewer systems were... Um, in place, and so it's just, yeah, that that that's the right reaction. You just shudder. It's like in, in London, basically. And uh, surprise, surprise, there are disease outbreaks, right? <laughs> um, and but they didn't know, they didn't have the that germ theory of disease. So um, this map, which you can you can see here, this is the actual map. Um, I believe just to maybe touched up a little bit, but this is. The map that was made, and you, if you look closely, you'll see these little black bars coming out of the, the different street locations, and better visualized here with the kind of 3D uh, red red bars. So each of these bars represents um, you. You'd have essentially them building up in uh, stacks like that, and what they represent are deaths in a household at a given address. And so you can see that there was quite a few people dying. And the thing about cholera is it, it acts very quickly. It infects your intestines and in particular your small intestine is normally, I think it's, I think it's small, uh, is normally extracting water from whatever you're digesting and pulling that out from the digesting stream into your bloodstream. Cholera ends up reversing those cellular mechanics and causing the reverse to happen, pulling the water out of your blood, out of your bloodstream, and into your digestive tract, which allows cholera itself to discharge its, you know, all the offspring that it's creating, all the multiplied bacteria, so that it can have a high enough infectious dose out in the environment, right? So it, cholera has to exist in the world in high doses because it takes such a high dose to infect something. So in, as part of the disease is just the way it is and the way it operates, it, you know, it guarantees that it's going to be in high quantities wherever, you know, after any infection. And so for, for people in the 1850s who did not know enough about um, the physiology and all of this, it would kill people very quickly because you'd be dehydrating like that. And it was, um, must have been incredibly awful and scary, you know, to see somebody who was completely healthy today and then you go by their house tomorrow afternoon and they're like just about dead on a, on a cot. You know, it's, that would be terrifying. Um, the and then- The water in the water probably got more cholera in it. 
Yep. So if you're if you're giving them water and it's not doing anything for them, but you know, giving them problems or more problems. Now at that point, maybe it might be better than nothing, right? But if if that keeps the infection going for longer, that would that would certainly be a problem. Uh, and at the end of the day, what they really needed was a clean water, but b to know that they they needed to hydrate them and to have salt. So rehydration salts has basically cut the um, the death toll, the death rates for cholera um, to to the point where it's it's very rare for people to die from cholera today. Whereas back then it was rare for the, the people in London here to survive um, if they had it. Um, so that and a IV drip, things like that, we have no real problem dealing with it. And then the disease will kind of clear itself out in about a week. Um, but if you're, if you're not staying hydrated, your body will, uh, will fail pretty quickly with, with that amount of dehydration. So that's that's kind of the crazy thing. How many people were dying? You know, maybe an entire family or you know a couple families living together. And I got one more three yeah, so some of these some of these addresses maybe there's a building with multiple um, multiple uh, dwelling places inside of it. Um, so multiple families and such. It's that would be kind of crazy. So it's it's a bit morbid. Um, but it's a it's a very easy and enjoyable read aside from the how morbid it is. <laughs> um, one thing you'll see here these uh, blue flags these are different pumps around um, with just uh, small groundwater wells and essentially the the story goes that as John Snow was looking around and decided to map who was getting sick and where they were because they were wanted to know, is this happening in the rich side of the neighborhood? Is this the poor side? You know, everybody thinks that it's the miasma, it's the, you know, has to do with the, the environmental conditions generally um, in this poor area, but why are the rich people over there also getting sick? You know, they were trying to figure it out. And so he mapped it. And at some point he realized, well, all of this is centered around this pump here, the Broad Street well pump. And so as soon as they sort of figured that out, they removed the pump handle so that people could not withdraw water from there anymore and essentially that stopped the outbreak. It turns out that there was an infant living in the house that was kind of butted up against that well. And of course the well was not deep enough and their latrine system thing was just draining basically into the well, which is nasty. Um, and that infant had um, had come in from out of town and was infected with cholera. Now, infants, their physiology is different, and it turns out that they, they are often, they're more likely to survive cholera or not be so inhibited by it. And it's probably because their gut is very small. Their gut's different. Yeah, their, their whole their whole system, their diet, like whatever it is, and I, there's well, they don't poop there's reasons. Anyway. <laughs> so there's there's medical reasons, and I don't remember all of them, but that you know, and I don't know that the infant may have ended up dying after a couple of weeks, but it was a longer lasting source for one, and um, yeah, just that it was right there. So that well was then infected, and then everybody drinking from that well was getting infected, um, and so. Essentially, you can see a few dots in some random places and these poor, unfortunate people that happened to be walking through that area and getting some water, um, was, that's likely what, what had happened. Um, so that's, that's the ghost map. That's um, one of the, the first cases where we really identified, hey, we need to, we need to treat this water. There's disease in the water. Um, and it's kind of crazy to think that that was only 1850s. It's At least not they blame that it on the government. <laughs> right. Final, finally, uh, advancing the the knowledge a little bit there. Okay, so I want to talk about um, disinfection technologies, strategies generally. Um, we'll, what we'll do is we'll cover 
um, chlorine in more depth probably next time. Get into UV light as a disinfectant. And then we're also going to add on advanced oxidation as a, a component of, um, you know, as kind of a follow up to these chemical disinfectants and the UV. It's something we can combine. We don't normally use advanced oxidation specifically for disinfection, although it would work fine. Um, it's usually a little bit more costly and designed to get rid of um, pharmaceuticals and other things that are just tougher to destroy and require or warrant that extra attention to killing stuff or you know destroying stuff. So uh, free chlorine would be our kind of our gold standard, what we always think of when we think about chlorinating something. Um, we will typically apply free chlorine as chlorine gas, Cl2, um, which will actually react with water. Um, so if we have Cl2 gas, this is going to react with water and we're going to end up forming, um, we'll end up getting a Cl minus in the process, but we will, that reaction with water will get us an HOCl. So taking one, the O here and one of the H's, one of the chlorines, that gives us the HOCl and it's going to give us, kick off a proton. So we get a bit of acidity, one of the chloride atoms, chlorine atoms, um, gets kicked out as a chloride. And then the other is this HOCl. And this is one of the things we describe as free chlorine. Um, this free chlorine, this HOCl or hypochlorous acid, this is in equilibrium with its conjugate base, OCl minus. So we have this equilibrium reaction that's driving the difference between um, HOCl and OCl minus. Now, you might not think that this is too important, except that HOCl is a stronger disinfectant. Um, so we actually do have to worry ourselves with how much of our free chlorine is existing in HOCl compared to OCl minus. Um, since HOCl is the stronger of the two, we really want to make sure that the majority of the chlorine that we're applying is in that form. If you were to look at typical rate constants, I think OCl minus tends to be like 10 times weaker in terms of the, uh, the speed at which it's disinfecting things. Um, so we'll say that the HOCl, this is the stronger one. So that means we want our disinfectant um, process, disinfection process to be slightly acidic so that we have more of the H plus that drives the, the equilibrium left so that we end up with more HOCl. Um, so we'll go, we'll go through some examples um, in a few minutes and in general, we've seen this type of thing before already. Um, or certainly you've, you've seen it at least at some point in the past with equilibrium chemistry. So we'll, we'll go through it um, just to kind of give an example. But that's, that's free chlorine, and it doesn't really matter how we apply it. We could get NaOCl. This is our household bleach, actually. That'll dissociate in water into sodium and OCl minus. And then, of course, that OCl minus exists in equilibrium with HOCl. Right, so we can achieve HOCl with which, whichever form we're going to apply free chlorine. Um, could also do CaOCl2. Isn't that why, like, when you make bleach water, like, you, if you buy bleach concentrate, they always say make it with water. Yeah, so what the, the reason that they're, you know, a typical household bleach is going to be some of this sodium hypochlorite, and it's going to be slightly basic. Because HOCl is also a little bit volatile um, in terms of like it'll volatilize and um, you don't want to breathe yeah. um, chlorine gas e either in the Cl2 form or in va you know gas phase HOCl. Um, the other reason that they're, they're going to tell you to dilute it is um, they're going to provide it to you in a pretty high concentration. 
And so you don't need that high of a concentration. So it, it'll just last longer, right? It's, oh, so so the, I thought it was like because it needs water. It's so into like the chlorine or whatever. Usually it's already diluted down to like 5% chlorine. Uh, it's, it's already high that that happens. Yeah, you just like don't. Stuff that's in your lab. So some of the stuff in the lab, we might have like 10 or 15%. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the household bleach container, at most you're going to have like five. Um, okay. Or it'll be like three to five range, something like that. I'm just, I was just curious if it was like 100% you know, NaOCl, <laughs> would it even, would it just volatize? Would it I mean, it, if you had pure NaOCl, that might even be just a salt, like a uh, solid. Okay. You know, I'm not sure what that, that would sense. be. Yeah, it, it's kind of strange to think about, like, wait, what form is this? <laughs> yeah, like, we can just use a solid. It's kind of like, right. but I guess to make it a liquid, you got to dilute it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then usually they'll put some stabilizers in it as well to make sure that it's not, you know, to slow down any just random reactions that it's going with. They're going to put it in a opaque container so that light can't get through and start photolyzing it, which does happen. If you, if you have chlorine in your in a, like a bottle of water and you leave it in the sun, it'll actually dechlorinate it um, before too long in terms of the free chlorine um, because it is uh, light reactive. Now, the, if you had combined chlorine in there, it might take a little longer. So combined chlorine is what we use as our residual chlorine. So these are what we call the residual. Now this is, there are several chloramines and essentially it's just some combination of OCL and an amine group. So it could be uh, NH, let's see if I can get this um, combinations right, NH2 OCL, because that's one minus an NH, I think that should be NH3. I think that's that's one because that'll be a, a one minus and a one plus. Um, you know, I'm. NH4. Yeah, well, NH four would make sense, but then we can't have the bond. So I think I'm just because um, nitrogen can be in a couple different oxidation states, and and so that's throwing me off here. The point being, I th there's a couple forms, and I think the other one would be. OCL2, something along those lines. This, would, I guess that would be more likely to be this 2 and this is 3. Um, it all depends on how excited nitrogen is. Yeah, the, the oxidation state of nitrogen. Well, and then that's what I'm forgetting at the moment of which one it corresponds to directly. And then you can have more hydrogens here to, to add more charge, counterbalancing the other charge. So we have, um, I, you know, I think there's also NH, just NHOCL, some amount. So anyway, there, there's a few. Um, next time I'll bring I'll bring exact examples for you. But there's a few classes: um, uh, monochloramine, dichloramine, and trichloramine, um, for example. And then you can have some other combinations. I think as well, maybe with uh, some other groups. At any rate, these are what we would consider our um, chloramines, and we will intentionally add ammonia to our disinfection process at the end of it in order to react and consume the remaining free chlorine and produce this combined chlorine to send down our distribution. This is also important in wastewater where we have lots of ammonia just present because of all the biological material. Um, biological material, when we break it down, will tend to form um, ammonia or ammonia containing or amine containing groups. So those will react with chlorine and scavenge the chlorine maybe when we didn't want it to. We wanted to disinfect the wastewater, now we're forming a bunch of chloramines, and that's you know kind of a not ideal condition. So when we're treating wastewater, if we're going to chlorinate it, that's that's a challenge to consider and, um, and to, to overcome to make sure the process is working well. The one other thing I'll say about combined chlorine is if you're ever at a uh, public swimming pool or something 
and you can really feel the chlorine in the water and it's like kind of stinging your eyes and you smell and it's like, oh man, they, it's like they over chlorinated it. Well, in reality, what probably has happened is the chlorine was there and then somebody peed in the pool or just sweated a lot in the pool. Let's just pretend that's the case, right? Same, basically the same thing, but we'll, we'll go with the sweat because that's better to think about. Um, and then there's a lot of ammonia in the pool and you get the formation a lot of, of a lot of uh, these chloramines and those ones are actually what's ca are causing the irrit irritation and the, the smell. So free chlorine doesn't irritate to the same extent or smell to the same extent. Um, it's free chlorine tends to be a little less volatile in terms of um, volatilizing and uh, smelling it. It's hard thing to sweat. Well, if you're, I mean, if you're swimming laps or if it's hot, hot outside and you're sweating, they you jump know? in. How do you improve it? Improve <laughs> 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 your sweating. <laughs> this, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> you, know, you know, what else is kind of crazy to think about? You can get hypothermia in 89 degree water yeah, if you, if you let, stay there long enough. The people, the swimmers that go from like try to swim like very long distances, like from Cuba to, to Florida, they have to worry about hypothermia. Yeah. yeah. And because it's just that long-term exposure, extracting a little bit of heat away for so long. It's just kind of bizarre to think about because we're not normally like, you know, having that much heat, heat loss. It's like, if it's 89, that's hot. <laughs> you know? Well, I think what most people get, when they with a hypothermia, we think about is mostly shock. Mm -hmm. Like that's what, that's mostly what really is what causes you to kind of go into your, your, your whole body is like what's happening mm -hmm. versus like you know kind of like that slow hypothermia where you just go to sleep. Right. That's essentially what happens. Yeah. I remember them talking about that. On, well, I was actually in the Boy Scouts and talked about that. They were mm -hmm. like, it's, it's all right, whenever you treat somebody for hypothermia, like you treat them for shock first, mm -hmm. and then you you worry about you know warming them up and whatnot. Nice. Interesting. So there's a one other um, type of chlorine we use sometimes that's chlorine dioxide. This tends to act a lot like free chlorine. Um, the chemistry is a little bit different, and I don't think we end up with a um, with an equilibrium um, equation involved. But effectively, it's about as reactive as free chlorine as we typically know it, and it may well be categorized as free chlorine um, uh, as well. Uh, it's got a similar reactivity. It's not as commonly applied. Um, I think you have to, you, I think that is a gas and you have to apply it as a gas. So that's not, not quite as often used, but in some cases it is. Then we've got uh, another chemical disinfectant would be ozone. We know ozone is natural um, oxidant. We don't like it in our, our lower atmosphere, the troposphere, because it's a lung irritant. If you've got asthma, participates in a lot of photochemical reactions, creates radicals, things like that. So in terms of, you know, our daily exposure to it, um, you probably know it as, oh, the ozone layer or, oh, the smog. Um, but it's a natural oxidant. We can certainly use it as a disinfectant, much like chlorine. Um, it's, it works quite well, and it has a particular, um, particularly good use against cryptosporidium spores and the like, where the cryptosporidium often shell up in a, a hard cyst that protects itself from the environment, um, also makes it difficult to treat, and therefore more likely to make its way into our water. And so one of the good technologies or treatment options to use for that um, is ozone. So we'll say good for, good for crypto. <clears throat> so that's, um, those are the primary chemical ox oxidants that we use for disinfection for drinking water. I will add as a side note here, um, just going to put a little star here. There's kind of a, a newer 
a newer oxidant that we have started using, especially in wastewater, um, which is paracetic acid, which is essentially acetic acid, which is vinegar, with hydrogen peroxide. Um, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, plus acetic acid, which I'm not remembering its chemical formula right now. Um, they, they will exist separately. You get, so you've got the, the vinegar, you've got the hydrogen peroxide, but they're also in e going to be in equilibrium with paracetic acid. And the, that combination can be uh, a decent treatment option. Acetic acid is not particularly toxic. We don't mind discharging that into the environment. It's not a, not a big concern. It's easy for um, organisms to digest or get rid of. And it's not, you know, it's not going to be added in such high amounts that it's creating a lot of oxygen demand or anything like that. So it's something that we can use in our wastewater and get some pretty good disinfection. Can potentially also combine that with um, advanced oxidation, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, there, there are others we could also consider. Um, iodine, for example, is sometimes used iodine tablets for like going hiking or something. Uh, in a pinch, you can use it. Might taste bad, but would disinfect your water, and you'd, you'd be able to uh, consume it safely. You can't do it all the time. You don't want to do it all the time, right? Um, so that's that's kind of the the rundown of the primary chemical disinfectants up to that point. Um, next, I would say ultraviolet light would be would be the next one, and we'll go ahead with our our demonstration. So I've got a, a neat Steri pen here. Um, you know, before I before I do that, if you haven't seen the Lifesaver bottles, I brought that too. This is a membrane filtration unit that you can pump by hand, you pressurize it. You first have to pour, pour your water in the uh, that side, the dirty water, and you kind of have a little bit of a, a crude filter to catch particles here. Then the water essentially goes in and around outside of the, the primary chamber. And then your pressurization is going to allow you to push water through the membrane, which is, if you can kind of see the sidewalls, there's a kind of grid stuff. We can pass this around in a minute. Um, and then it's going to pressurize it through there and then into the, the main drinking chamber. And it also has a... Um, open. So there's a, a small chamber in the middle um, where it collects the water and then you can have a little carbon filter just to kind of polish it up, get rid of chemical stuff that would make it through the, the microfiltration membrane here. Actually, it's probably ultrafiltration, technically. So this is probably a 0.22 micron filter, something like that that'll catch a lot of viruses, um, pretty much all bacteria, all protozoa, something like that. So it would do a pretty good job in a pinch. It's got like uh, little labels on how to use it. And essentially you just pump it by hand. It'll pressurize, be a little bit tough. Once I get it pressurized, we should be able to uh, hear it. So it's pretty neat. Um, I think there's newer newer versions. Had this one for a little while. Haven't really used it. Um, so that's kind of cool. I also have this Steri pen, and I'm I'm actually kind of excited to see these get replaced by LED devices. Um, this is a small fluorescent light inside of here, and it's a, got a special case that is UV transmittent. Um, it is a plastic case, so it is absorbing some of the UV, less effective than it could be. Um, but it's designed so that it will only turn on when it's submersed. So, brought my water bottle so we can check it out. Now we wouldn't want to expose ourselves to the UV, but fortunately the plastic here will absorb all of it. And even if it was shining um, from here, I would have some issues so I would want to look away and cover my skin. But you guys, it wouldn't actually reach you. The, the UV attenuates so quickly through our atmosphere whatever ozone and all the oxygen in our atmosphere is actually absorbing it quite strongly. You can play with this in, uh, in my lab with our 
UV lights and have a UV radiometer and hide ourselves, but have the UV radiometer exposed and kind of check how far is this actually traveling. And it, it really d diminishes quite rapidly. Um, but if we have batteries, there we go. You can see um, just kind of shining that blue color. That blue is not the UV. Um, in fact, no, we shouldn't be able to see any of the UV ourselves. But the, the idea here is you just kind of stir it, and that UV is disinfecting my water. Um, and then as soon as I pull it out, yep, it stops. And it's like, oh, what well. Is so this is mercury, and it's a low pressure mercury lamp, so that emits at 254 nanometers. That's the characteristic peak. That's what most of our um, most of our UV disinfection technology has been uh, designed around for quite some time. And I'll, my I mom, she works for this um, factory school system, mm -hmm. and during COVID, they they handed out all these UV lamps, like. And I was looking at them, and they're like they're like a UV, they're like a UVB, um, oh UVB lamp, and they're and my mom was like, can you just run this? And I was like, mom, you have to like leave this here for about a couple minutes. Like you can't just <laughs> and you'd be done. Like it's 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 not a very high, you know. And, and please wear some glasses. We were just out without, I think, well, they handed Thanks. them out like they like you so safe, and I was like, dude, you gotta be a little careful. It's like don't. You know, definitely don't leave them out for the kids. Definitely don't you know, do this. And she's like, oh, I didn't even realize. Like, right. Yeah, like, it's like, right. You know, first off, you can't just do that, like, one little swoop. Because that's what she was doing. She was like, yeah, all I do is, hmm? Like, it does nothing. <laughs> it's absolutely nothing. Like, you literally have to right. sit there probably for about, if you're really trying to kill a virus, probably around five minutes. Well, and it, you, it'll you, depend on the dose, right? Yeah, yeah. To totally. And, you know, I guess what, what whatever, I guess whatever is on the, um, but she deals with like um, special needs kids, so like there's there's gonna there's gonna be a lot. <laughs> so like you know that's why they handed them out to her. Right. To do that, and I was like, you're better off just hitting with the Clorox wipes. Right. Like, 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 I know it's cool, but like it's a cool idea. It's fun, but there is a an important safety factor there, and uh, if it is it that like almost it was like almost you can see. I think it was like at, at three, like three fifty eight. Like three hundred five or something like. Yeah, the three hundred five. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was. It was I couldn't remember. I, did, I couldn't remember what the other number was. <laughs> yeah. So we'll we'll talk about. We'll talk more about the different ranges and but that, but that's like, the the stuff that is carcinogenic, um, in some sense. It's not. It's not quite DNA denaturing very much, although maybe a little bit, <laughs> which is not good for general public use, um, but it. Uh, that that's the the highest energy portion of sunlight that does reach us is yeah. kind of that that spot. Um, so that that is definitely sunburn territory, um, and not the good kind. <laughs> um, it's also kind of funny that you know we we got all excited about disinfecting surfaces and everything, and then you know a few months into the pandemic, we we start to learn that. Well, really, the corona coronavirus dies pretty quick on surfaces when it dries out, and it's not really fomite transmittable as for any reasonable, you know, amount. But all that momentum to like go for it, you know, it, it takes takes a while for the the scientific findings to catch up and say, okay, well, it was good. It was a good idea, a good theory to to start protecting that. No problem to keep surfaces clean, but. I don't think anybody else here saw like the flu numbers this year. They were like the lowest it's been in the past 50 years. Like just the amount of flu, like just because just because people were so they're wearing masks and everything and doing that. It's like wow. You know? The the other strange thing about the flu is that we actually don't report it. So I when we talked about the Flint water crisis, we talked about reportable diseases and why why we were reporting Legionnaires' disease. We report coronavirus, obviously, but flu, influenza, we actually don't have that reporting system. So whenever you see the numbers, at least historically, it's been estimated on some computer models. Mm -hmm. It's like we estimate the burden of influenza based on this amount of respiratory distress or cases, hospitalizations, deaths. We're just estimating it. <laughs> so I'm, all this fun, I'm, fun 
I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they were good estimates, but they're still estimates, right? So it's, it's, I don't know what to make of it because it, it's just weird. You know, it's like, you know, obviously. Uh, they, they, I mean, how else did you test for it? Like, you know, they, like when, when you go to the thing, they test to see if you have flu. Like, why can't you just count it? Like, well, because it's not, it's not mandated, right? It's not, there's not a system. The reporting requirements aren't there because it's, I guess, not important Some enough. Some people may report <laughs> There, and there's no collection. There's no surveillance happening. Um, so it, there's surveillance for key or, you know, key diseases. Oh, and I guess, silly. I guess, you know. Why but, even say the number you, then? You're just like, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that, I think, I feel like that's confused everybody a little bit. When, when trying to make sense of COVID and how important, uh, you know, what, what the risks actually are, you know. So you think COVID is not going to be here the counting cases of COVID? Well, I mean, it, it has been reportable, right? Well, I'm so, saying, like, so now, like, in the future, like, say five years from now, do you still be counting it? That's a good question. So five years from now, it, what'll be interesting is to see kind of the, the trajectory of the disease itself, because in some ways, it seems like it might just be like a normal common cold, except that nobody was, had been exposed to it before. So the our bodies were overreacting and having much more traumatic responses. And so this, what maybe in five, 10 years from now, when everybody's gone through it or had at least the vaccine sort of thing, it might be that our bodies are just recognizing it kind of like we recognize the common cold. We'll get it, we'll cough, we'll be done with it, we'll spread it, and nobody notices it. it's different than the common cold. That, that might be the natural progression of things and how all of our other coronaviruses that are that are known as common colds and the rhinoviruses, that might be how they all started. It's like a really bad cold season and like people were dying if they were vulnerable and stuff. And then eventually it progressed to the point where everybody had been exposed and it's just, you know, people die from the common cold. It can lead to pneumonia and stuff like that. But it's people that, you know, any of us in the room, we would be shocked, right? But, you know, people that are near death anyway or something, it's like obviously sad and, we don't want it, but it's like that there are cases where it wouldn't really surprise us that some something pushed somebody over the edge, right? So maybe that's that's what it's gonna be like. I'm, that's that's my best guess, but I, I don't know. So in the, I, I read uh, an article somewhere that was comparing a, um, a pandemic in, I think it was 1895 or something that was influenza-like or may have been a coronavirus and one of the, the ones that is now one of our common colds. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm happy that we're, we're getting on the vaccinations and everything, but you know, it's, it's been, been strange. Have you gotten yours? No, not yet. In fact, I, I set up, so I, I just got email, an email, LSU's like, Hey, we have, um, back, Vaccination session on Friday, and the faculty and staff and grad students are all available, well, ready my, now. All well, my friends were talking about how um, if you if you really want it, like say because it's free, you just go to the go to um to like Walmart or something like that, and yep. say you say you're a smoker, and then you don't have <laughs> no, you don't have insurance, and you're a smoker, mm. and then it's free, and then it doesn't it doesn't hurt because a lot of people like if you claim you're a smoker on your um your um. Uh, your insurance. Your insurance. Your insurance rates will go up. Just don't, just, just don't, just say don't give them insurance. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my friend did. Like at least two or three of them did the same exact thing, and they got they got their vaccinations at home. Yeah, they just did. Nice. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> Well, apparently right. they have so many of them. Yeah. Like, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I I scheduled like uh, undergraduate advising sessions all for Friday, and that's like Friday's the day they're doing it. I'll just do it later. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but yeah, well, I'll get there before long, I suppose. But yeah, it, it's been interesting, and I think the the whole world knows a little bit more about disinfection now, whether whether or not they. Uh, know the right stuff. Yeah. <laughs> That's another question. <laughs>
been been kind of funny being on a you know somewhat of a a tangential expert maybe we'll, we'll say during all this okay so i wanted to come back to a free chlorine um here i mentioned the uh, equilibrium chemistry we have hocl and ocl minus Um, and H plus in equilibrium. And so it, like any equilibrium reaction, um, there's going to be, you know, the total amount of free chlorine in solution is the sum of both of those. So we can say total. And what, when I say total, I'm, I'm really talking in molar terms. So the, the number of molecules that include O, C, and, or o and Cl, that, that kind of group there. Um, is going to be equal to the essentially the concentration of the two added. It's what I'm writing here is very obvious when you think about it, um, but when you're solving problems, you might not be thinking um, about the obvious that happens sometimes, and so that I wanted to write that up and remind you of that that that's a, a simple principle that gives us one one piece of the equation if we need to if we need to solve we've got two unknowns we need a system of equations to substitute this is often one of them um, so then the other equation that we need just kind of as a refresher is our equilibrium equation as it's defined um, our equilibrium constant defines the ratio between the, the products and the reactants And I should go ahead and actually write that up a little more proper here. We have A, A's, and B, B's going in equilibrium with C, C's, and D, D molecules. Then our Ka equals our uh, products, so C to the small c times D to the small d over A, A, and B to the B. So that's our generic form, um, just as a reminder of equilibrium reactions, how we define that equilibrium constant. Um, and essentially that equilibrium constant then tells us information about how those, how those molecules relate in the equilibrium um, equation. So if we have, for example, our HOCl, then our Ka, um, this will be equal to H plus times, uh, just to the one power, times OCO minus to the one power divided by HOCl. So that's our, our form. And what you'll notice here is that H plus is going to give us a way for the pH of the solution to drive, essentially drive it back and forth in terms of which form do we have more of. We could solve this in terms of Ka and H plus, you know, and put it in some sort of ratio. We can just leave it, let's just divide both sides by the, the H plus, which is essentially pH. Then we're left with OCL minus divided by HOCl, so the ratio of how many one compared to the other would then just be equal to Ka divided by H plus. So then if we take that and look at how we graph, graph it, we can see that if we just take a look at that ratio, when there's more OCl minus than HOCl, then OCl minus is going to be you know, there's going to be more of it. More of the total chlorine is occupied. More of the proportion of HOCl and OCl minus is going to be in the OCl minus form. And so that's this pink line is when is the OCl minus. So when this number is greater than one, that means that this guy is above 50%. 
when they're when this is equal to one then they're both at 50 percent that happens right here right so when we have ocl minus is greater than one that means when we compare ka to h plus there is a smaller amount of h plus so smaller h plus means a um, bigger number here which means there's more ocl here so less acidity, less H+, plus, higher pH, higher amount of OCL minus. So it should end up being intuitive when you, when you think it through. Um, and we can do that comparison. And then the Ka here then defines where this equal, equal case happens. And it turns out that Ka for this, this particular equation at, you know, typical room temperature is 10 to the negative 7.54. So that means that if you were to look, this, this occurs right at pH 7.54. Okay, so uh, don't know when's the last time you've done, done these types of equations, but as you can see, it's gonna be very important to be able to relate our pH to our free chlorine because we need to know at what um, at what pH excuse me at a given pH how much of the chlorine is in our usable um, portion of the HOCl because that's the one we want um, to have the most of because that's the more that's the stronger disinfectant so if you look here if we even go to pH 7 about 80% of our solution is HOCl, the one we want. So even at a neutral pH, we're okay. Um, if we go down to, let's say six, pH six, we're up above 90, 95%, maybe 97% here. So it doesn't take a, a large pH adjustment here to, to have a, a good impact on our disinfectant of choice. Um, so it's important to keep in mind, and it's very useful that we can manipulate it that you know that easily, and that's why almost all of our disinfection processes are in, that involve free chlorine are going to be performed at pH five to six range. I was designing a an exam for my other class um, last night, and I put in a problem there that compared free chlorine to um, so HOCl to HOBr, um, hypobromic acid, I suppose, has the same situation, the same case in terms of HOBr is stronger, but in that case, the equilibrium constant's actually out here, and so pH 7 or 8 is still going to have more of the HOBr. So just kind of an interesting uh, thing there. You, some swimming pools do use bromine instead of chlorine. Um, and one of the reasons you might want to do that is if you don't care to control your pH quite as well, you can achieve the same thing, um, the same uh, equilibrium um, manipulation with higher pHs. Maybe there's some other reasons um, as well. Um, so, oh, yeah. I was gonna, so when you were at pH 9, how would you get it? Would you just add like hydronium or something? You'd add acid. Um, acid. A lot so of times. Imagine you wouldn't want to add any new. So w typically, what you're going to be adding, um, I think probably the most common will be sulfuric acid okay. um, or hydrochloric acid. So HCl um, is pretty standard, especially in labs. H2SO4, so sulfuric acid is also pretty pretty common. Um, maybe you don't want to be adding sulfate in some cases, so you, you might want to be um, concerned about that. But those are typical mineral acids. You want to you generally want to use a mineral acid so that when it dissociates, you're just left with a mineral or a just a inorganic ion and the protons. Um, so that's that's pretty common. 
It's also why if you're working in a lab, you generally are okay to flush mineral acids down the pipe, unless it's like hydrofluoric acid, then don't do that. <laughs> um, but generally it's it's okay to just because that's that's just gonna be a, a little bit of chloride. And you do the same thing when you add some sodium chloride to water or whatever, you know, it's you're not adding anything that's crazy, any organic acids or anything like that. Um, on the flip side, if you need to, to make a process more basic, you probably add um, sodium hydroxide or some sort of al alkaline um, stuff. Uh, it will depend a little bit on your, your process. Water softening, for example, you're going to um, be controlling both pH and the alkalinity as um, carbonate. So that there's and sometimes switching back and forth. So there's there's some interesting stuff there. Um, maybe we'll get into after disinfection if we if we have time and interest. Oops, that blank. Okay, it's like that's not the end of the slides. That I hit B instead of spacebar. Okay, so here's a little practice problem um, to get us familiar with the process. Um, we have. 15 milligrams per liter of HOCl is added to potable water for disinfection. The final measured pH is 7. What is the percent of HOCl that is not dissociated is our question here. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the equilibrium constants are temperature dependent. So that's why we were given a temperature. Um, we could use a lookup table. I'm just going to say that We'll just go with that, that default value I was using earlier, 10 to the negative 7.54. So take a moment, think about what that's asking for. We don't have a lot of time left in class, so we'll just kind of do kind of a quick overview and we can pick up here next time. So we just have two minutes, so I'm going to kind of just 
touch on what they're asking for, and we'll, we'll pick up here next time. But um, when it says what percent of the HOCL is not dissociated, essentially we added HOCL, you know, 15 milligrams per liter into some, some amount of water, and then we know the pH. And so when it says dissociated, we're talking about a dissociation reaction going forward to H plus and OCL minus. So it's dissociating into these two components. Now, we know that this is going to be in an equilibrium, and so some of it is not going to dissociate, or effectively it's going to reassociate or find that balance, right? So what the questioning is asking us to do is to find what percent of the total is still as HOCl. So what we're going to look for is something like HOCl divided by the total chlorine. We may be able to do this without um, actually solving with the molecular weight for the chlorine. If I, th I think there's a, a clever algebraic, algebraic way we can do that, just knowing the pH and our equilibrium constant. Or you could, um, you could use the mass, find the, the molar units, and you'd end up using the same algebra, but it, you know, it might make it easier for you to intuit if working out that process. So I, either way you go, um, one thing to highlight here is whenever we're working with these equilibrium equations, of course, it is um, imperative that we are in molar units, not mass units, because we're doing it on a, a number of molecules comparison. So we'll, we'll pick up there next time. If you're feeling uncomfortable with equilibrium reactions, definitely encourage you to practice, um, practice with that. All right. And that's all I've got for you today. So we'll see you guys on Thursday. Oh, I did post the second homework. It's um, the uh, m on membranes, essentially. Um, I also graded the homeworks. I'll post those, um, the grades soon. I'll, I should have the review assignments back to you on Thursday as well. Um, okay, so we'll see you guys next time.